Welcome everybody to the Genius Brewing live stream. That is a live stream we do every single Sunday at 8.45 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, the format of the show is something similar to we do some Genius Brewing or reg regular brewing um, news, breakdown of what's going on around the tap room and or in the beer industry in general. Then we go into a style of the week. Good. Where we break down a style <laughs> via BJCP guidelines or whatever guidelines we see um, fit. Then we go into two discussion topics, and today's are going to be talking about cascales and ways to get maltiness in your beer without necessarily adding crystal or sweet malts. Uh, what, what's wrong with crystal malts, Peter? They are the best, and they are just so good, and everybody loves them. Uh, so let's just go ahead and jump into some Genus Brewing news. What? Uh, so these guys apparently started a new channel without me. <laughs> I was uh, informed of that midweek. Yeah, we started a new channel. So basically the idea is we want to have a platform that uh, eventually better pushes the Will It Beer series or the, uh, the videos that we do are more entertainment style. So we want to be able to have a platform to do more entertainment based um, videos for you guys. And that isn't dampened by uh, you know the current people that we have that follow us on this channel. So a lot of people follow us strictly for information uh, for genus not for Gina stuff, but for uh, how to brew kind of stuff. And so when we release an entertainment video, that actually pushes that video down because a lot of people don't click on those. And so we're starting a new channel to hopefully get that entertainment content up. It is called Genus Not Brewing, and you should all subscribe to it right now. So, uh, yeah, we'll post a link to that in the description, unless you did already. Did you already do it? I haven't done it yet, but I oh, will. Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah. So if you are tuning in after this was live, we will have a link in the description below. Um, also, uh, we got a couple of random customers, uh, in slash, uh, one of them was at, or actually no, both of them were both of them on the, the last Will It Beer. Uh, yeah, both yeah. of them. There are two contestants from the lobster Will It Beer, which is, if you haven't watched, you should watch. Um, but two of our contestants from there did a, uh, light beer tasting challenge against Ryan. So you get to see Ryan on video and you get to see the two Will It Beer contestants tasting light beer. <laughs> and just thinking, uh, deciding if they can tell the difference between them and if they can guess which one. So if you want a good laugh, you can see um, what it takes for two people that have uh, fairly experienced palates um, compared to somebody that probably has very, very little experience. <laughs> but probably more experience with those with types the, of With beer. the light beers, yeah. Probably has drank more light beers, but doesn't necessarily pay attention to the difference between them. Um, so that's really fun. We got a new mill in stock, which we're really excited to put together and show you guys. It's the um, big pro brewing mill from Blickman. Yeah, shout out to Blickman. Uh, these guys, did we reach out to them or they reach out to us? Uh, I reached out to Ben on this one. Okay, yeah. So um, been a while, actually. That was, that was months back. But we finally, as of Friday, just received the pro brewing mill from Blickman. And, uh, yeah, we actually just barely took the thing out of the box. Plan on putting together a whole... Um, review type video for you guys on that but I can tell you right now the thing's a beast it's heavy yeah like it's uh, just the just the guts of it weigh about 50 pounds so. general general breakdown on why we're excited for this we currently <laughs> have an independent roller mill this is geared which means it's gonna be easier to grab that crush uh, it's got an oversized hopper currently our hopper only holds 12 pounds of grain so an oversized yeah. hopper is gonna be great and the stand that it comes on looks really really sweet so yeah so. we're excited to put it together and show you guys what's going on there uh, we got a seltzer back on tap. Yeah, so uh, Tim's got the next rounds of seltzies uh, on on tap. Well, we got one of them on tap. We got another flavor um, on standby for when the, that keg blows. But yeah, the one on tap is strawberry basil. Strawberry basil, yeah. Which you guys would basil. know already if you followed us on Instagram. So go do that immediately. Yeah. So uh, yeah, excited. Finally, for those of you that really love the the seltzies, um, come get them. Really important. We uh, we dissolve the can. Super important. Completely, actually. Yeah. Like, it's just a little piece of plastic floating around it and caustic now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that was exciting. If you guys want to see the do, see us do that in a video, uh. <laughs> let us know. Um, uh, Shay's pretty good at art, we found out. That's, uh. that's kind of neat. The person oh, who yeah, designs can, to do uh, our art. Oh, yeah, there we go. Good. Look, you can even see the uh, some of the artwork in the uh, kind of upper corner there. So. Yeah, you can see two of them. The best ones are further in, though, so you'll have they, to come to the are. tap room if yeah. you want to find those. Um, yeah, and he's also designing some labels for us, so that should work out really nicely. Um, speaking of Will It Beer, kind of jumping on, uh, around a little bit, we are also going to be filming another Will It Beer today, um, and that one is going to be a clash of champions. Uh, well, it's going to be me versus Tim, so that'll be fun. People who know how 
our systems here work in every single malt, hops, and yeast that we carry uh, already going head to head in a Willow Beer Challenge. That'll yes. be fun. And um, our uh, resident knucklehead and uh, videographer slash editor. Uh, we'll actually be choosing the ingredients with, for this. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to kind of stand there probably with a camera on the side and see what happens. Should be a hoot. I'm excited <laughs> to see what my ingredients are going to be. Uh, there's a chance that we will be kind of normally opened at 25% capacity in the near future. <laughs> yeah, maybe. We'll see. Maybe. We'll see. It sounds Rules like... Rules got changed. We only need three out of the four stipulations now uh, to get r opened in phase two. So. But I guess our uh, politicians aren't getting paychecks all of a sudden. They're like, oh, wait a second. <laughs> wait a second. We <laughs> well, got to change switch this. Let's some stuff. <laughs> um, and yeah, people have been supporting our Will It Beers series through our PayPal link, which we've been putting below the Will It Beers, as well as some videos that we've published since then. So thank you so much to anybody who has donated Again, to the next Will It Beer. thank you so much. That uh, really helps these things keep going. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, on that note, uh, let's go on to our Beer of the Week. Bum, 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 beer of the Week. Oh, yeah. Woo. And uh, Category 11. Category 11. Uh, that's that's all actually it. it. All of them. All um, of the 11th category. <laughs> uh, and for those of you that aren't, like, uh, super, super rehearsed on uh, the 2015 BJCP guidelines, Category 11 is British Bitters. Um, and that actually gets broken down into three subcategories, all of which um, are actually going to more or less share the same qualities. Um, and it starts with an ordinary bitter, um, which is kind of on the essentially um, very, very sessionable, uh, low alcohol, very light bodied range, um, goes up to best bitter, um, which is the uh, middle range, and then a strong bitter, which uh, most people know as an ESB or extra special bitter. Um, which is going to be um, a little bit stronger and generally more body, more mouthfeel, more malt character. So still upsets me that things just got renamed all over the place. <laughs> yeah, There's but no ESB uh, category anymore. Yeah, well, and the reason why you know I decided to lump all these together is that um, you know the key the key takeaway with this style is even though they're called bitter. Yeah. Um, they are actually very, very well balanced beer styles. And they're um, very, very drinkable, and that has a lot to do with not only uh, the ingredients that are used, uh, the balance of the ingredients, the water chemistry, everything that we always talk about, but also uh, typical serving mechanisms and how you might choose to both ferment and uh, condition these beers. So, uh, yeah, so let's get uh, right into it. Um, so, yeah, these are going to be um, really emphasize the, the, the malts that you use, um, a nice, rich, English malt is is really the star yep. um, in these beers. Um, you actually want, I know it sounds weird, you'd think they'd be a hoppy beer, but they're not. They're actually, um, you, you want that malt flavor to be shining through. Um, and uh, traditionally, these are actually served um, in a cask too. Um, and uh, depending on whether or not you're serving these beers in a cask, uh, or you're actually designing them to be um, on, on draft and be force carbonated like you would your, your um, typical beer, um, you're actually going to brew these guys a little bit differently. And uh, we will talk about that in our discussion topic. One other key takeaway, one other note, is that exported bitters, the bitters that a lot of us in America or around the world are getting from England specifically, uh, are often oxidized. A lot of that has to do with uh, heat exchange uh, that happens just in transport getting over here. So yeah, there's expansion and contraction happening in the bottles, and small amounts of oxygen can leak in there, yeah. which gives you some sherry notes and some, some extra sweet notes by the time that we taste them here. Yeah, and, uh, and that actually will end up emphasizing um, what a lot of people perceive as caramel-like character. And I think, did I even pull a quote from the style guidelines? Judges should not <laughs> overemphasize the caramel components of these styles. Exported bitters can be oxidized, which increases the caramel-like flavors, uh, as well as more some negative flavors sometimes. Um, so do not assume that oxidation-derived flavors or tra are traditional or required for the, the same style. There you go. So that is the elephant in the room that uh, we'll actually we'll be addressing today as well. Yeah. So, the um, bottom line there is if you are trying to make a nice, you know, best bitter or whatever you're trying to make, don't necessarily assume you need to add 20% crystal yeah. malts. Um, so let's go into some specs before we start um, kind of breaking down um, how we would build up um, the, these styles of beers and... Um, Let's start with the ordinary bitter. The IBUs on these are going to yeah. be 25 to 35. Again, a lot of the bitter component comes from the water chemistry. Um, original gravity between 1030 and 1039, so a very low original gravity. Final between 1007 and 10, uh, 1.0. 
1.11, which is relatively high for how low original gravity they start. So there's some malt component, but they can be pretty, uh, um, you know, pretty dry. Uh, ABV between 3.2 and 3.8, and SRM between 8 and 14 in the ordinary bitter. Perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah. So do have some color to them. So you are probably going to add some kind of adjunct malts um, to give you that little bit of higher color. Uh, but uh, otherwise, actually a very dry, um, very, very sessionable beer. This is, this is you know, your pub beer, right? Yeah. Um, that's that's the epitome of what an ordinary bitter is supposed to be. You get off work, you drink 14 to 16 of these, and you're good to go. Um, yeah, going on to the best bitter, um, this basically goes up a notch. Um, so you're looking at um, IBUs of 25 to 40, so just a little bit more um, uh, IBUs. The color range is essentially the same. Um, which is interesting. So you're probably dropping out um, some of those adjunct malts and starting to build up a little bit more of that color and a little bit more um, of that body with just your base malt. And uh, an OG of 1040 to 1048 with an FG of 1008 to 1012. Um, right around that 4-ish percent AVV is what you are shooting for. Um, so yeah, and that one's just basically stepped up a notch. And then finally we have our strong bitter or our ESBs. Which is again another step up. You're looking at 30 to 50 IBUs, 1048 to 1060 OG. That's kind of that normal range that you expect a lot of, you know, IPAs, pale ales in America to be. Uh, FG between 1010 and 1016. So again, this is getting a little bit more final gravity yep. body. So pretty Not wide a range there. Um, yeah, 1010 can be pretty dry. 1016 can feel pretty sweet. Uh, ABV between 4.6 and 6.2. So this is getting again into that pseudo IPA pale ale range. Uh, if we were connecting it to what Americans would do. Um, an SRM between 8 and 18. So that's like, you know, orangish all the way to definitely, definitely amber. Yeah. Um, copper, I believe, is how they actually describe a lot of those. Um, and, uh, yeah, so these are kind of what we typically see the most of, at least kind of our English variations. And a lot of times, you know, 18 is, while it's dark-ish, I've seen a lot of ESBs that are way darker. Oh, yeah. Like, a lot of, like yeah, they're, a lot of they're like that. 25. <laughs> Yeah, I've and, heard about uh, 25, but like, yeah, definitely pushing that 20, or at least they have a little bit of extra depth to their to their dark color. Um, but yeah, eight, uh, 18 can be like a lot of brown ales are 18 too, but it just kind of depends on how it perceives. Is it perceived yeah. from roast, or is it perceived from that red hue? Yeah, and uh, you know, typically the body and mouthfeel are going to follow these styles um, accordingly. Um, with that said, you know, the even the ESB or the the um, strong bitter, um, the mouthfeel can still be. Um, all the way from medium full, all the way down to medium and light, yeah. um, which is something you know I really want to highlight just because um, at least pretty much all the examples I've seen in America um, are definitely on that medium full range, um, if not even full. And these um, can be these can be fairly fairly dry beers in terms of FG. That body can be you know fairly absent, and uh, a big part of why they perceive all the way usually sweeter traditionally has to do with how they're served and conditioned. Yeah. Uh, Kent, hey, real quick, thank you so much. We appreciate the super chat. Yeah. Uh, that always helps us and makes us excited. Makes us feel like we're doing something right here. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so and it does say so too that um, for for a strong bitter, it does. It literally says it in the description. Drinkability is a critical component of this style, especially because um, you're gonna have 18 of them. So loading it up with two pounds of caramel 60 is not going to give you that drinkability that you're looking for. Like we've said all the time, we'd love caramel malt to use it in 100 percent of your beers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's jump into our malt of the week. Boom, boom, boom. Um, which is going to be uh, from Crisp Malt, um, and that is their Chevalier Malt. It is a heritage malt from them. And uh, honestly, this malt is perfect for these this general category because it gives you a sort of cracker biscuit like um, flavor with a fuller mouthfeel from the malt itself. And I think that this will lend really well to balancing out. Um, with the otherwise, you know, heavier bittering qualities um, that you're going to be throwing at it with the hops. It is a heritage malt, and as we said before, heritage malts are always going to have a kind of a unique component to them. They're not going to be as consistent as the mass, uh, the mass blended malts that you get from, like, let's say, Crisp's main pale ale malt or whatever. Uh, so a heritage malt is going to be a single varietal malt. It's coming from uh, usually a single plot or a you know, section of plots, and it is a heritage basically means it's a grain that's derived from you know, grains that we don't necessarily grow uh, for you know, mass production, things like you know, grains that we grow for flour or beer specifically. So it's a heritage malt, which means it's got character, and we love character, especially when you're ba with your base malts, especially with lighter bodied beers. Yeah, 
And typical with a lot of other heritage malts, um, this is going to have a little bit higher color range compared to a pale malt or a pilsner. Um, they've got their specs on here that say 2.7 to 4 Lova Bond. So um, that in itself is also going to help build up on that really, really nice golden color that you're typically looking for in these styles. So uh, yeah. make it so you don't have to use the dirty C word. The dirty, dirty C word. Um, otherwise, for other malts to build up, um, while caramel malts aren't necessarily inappropriate, um, I generally would say to stick to the lighter ones. Um, stick yeah. to your, your Carab 15s. Caribbeans are a good option as well. 15s, 20s, uh, um, even something like a, a caramel pills, which is kind of a pseudo caramel, pseudo dextrin yeah. malt. Yeah, we have, uh, I think I mentioned it last week, but yeah, we, we got in uh, one from a local maltster that just has this fantastic, um, almost like honey like. Uh, characteristic and they call it a, a Mickey's caramel pill. country club or King Cobra homebrew fly. Thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, Mickey's only if it's duct taped to my hands. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. Um, also um, speaking of kind of other malts that uh, might not necessarily be traditional, but I do think can, can add a little bit of uh, complexity and body if used in, um, you know, very moderate, the moderate small, small, small amounts, amounts yeah. um, would be uh, malts like melanoid malt and malts like honey malts. Those, those, uh, Oh yeah. What are those? What category are those falling again? I can't they're remember. they're like a pseudo biscuit. They're so yeah. they're um, honey malt specifically is different than melanoid malt, but the honey malt is lactic acid treated, um, and melanoid malt is it's basically a biscuit malt, but it's yeah. really intensely deriving those uh, those melanoidins. Yeah, but I would say you know small amounts of those. Um, you How know, do we're you play like around with like a really small amount of special B? Like yeah, for all your coloration, just like yeah. two ounces of special B can get you there. And again, you're losing a lot of the sweetness, but getting some of the complexity. Yeah, I would say like four to six ounces of, of your melanoid and your honey malt too. Just just real, just light, light little doses. Yeah, and I'd be willing to bet if you brewed right, you could probably do this as a single malt, just with something like the Chevalier Heritage. For sure. But that's yeah. going to get into some uh, techniques that we'll talk yeah, about I'd, later on in the show. I think the Chevalier malt as uh, for a best bitter, just I would just go 100% and just let it yeah. shine. Uh, Tim just did a West Coast IPA with the Chevalier Heritage, and it, it's, it's aromatic, it's uh, yeah. flavorful, it's, it's really quality malt. Um, all right, so let's go on to our hop of the week, and that is uh, a classic, actually. It's going to be Fuggles. Uh, uh, Fuggles is, you know, uh, first of all, pronounced Fuggles, because <laughs> F-U-G-G-L-E, and it is a, it's that classic English malt. It's uh, very, very similar genetically to Styria and Goldings, and so it's not that lemony, earthy kind of flavor that you get off of uh, Kent Goldings, but it does have some of that same kind of earthy component, and it leans just a little bit sweeter. Yeah, a little bit sweeter, almost can, can throw some mint notes. Um, and this is actually an old hop, too. Um, so, yeah, it was uh, 1861 was... Uh, when Columbus sailed the ocean. Was, uh, <laughs> no, it wasn't. That was a long time before that. Bubbles was not around before Columbus. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so it got popular in the 1900s, but since then has really been um, replaced... Uh, by higher alpha varieties, things like Target or Challenger, um, because it does have fairly low alphas. Usually um, right around that like uh, four-ish percent range is what you're going to be looking at for alpha acids. Um, and the total oil content as well is actually quite low on it. Um, but this to me is actually important in um, especially something like an ordinary bitter um, because having a degree of that grassiness in there as well um, is, is going to actually play an important factor in the way that this beer is perceived, the way that bitterness comes through. So having it actually a, a hop that's going to lend you to being able to use, you know, four ounces plus, five ounces probably even, in a beer like this is going to be really important. So Fuggles, Kent Goldings, they all kind of fall into that, yeah. um, that same kind of style. Yeah, and on the hops too, um, you know, typically they're used traditional hops. You can use American hops, um, but you're definitely going to want to scale back. Um, you got a higher oil content with American hops, usually higher alphas um, as well. Um, but a big, a big uh, thing to note on this, this category, I don't keep wanting to say style. Um, this category. This category uh, is, uh, is that these are very front end loaded. Um, and that's really a big thing that differentiates them from something like an American pale ale. Right. And it also helps reduce the perceived grassiness that you can potentially get if you were to put like five ounces of hops in a whirlpool where you have to kind of play some techniques to get those back out during fermentation or going into your fermenter. Uh, front loaded hops like this will naturally settle. Um, they grab onto some proteins. The proteins break out pretty easily and they don't have that same risk. Yeah. So when it comes to brewing these beers, um, yeah, Fuggles is going to be a classic one. Um, and you're going to be using probably, you know, two to maybe even three ounces of it as a bittering addition. Um, and then on the late side, um, with a lot of these styles, you could probably get away even without a late addition. If you do, I would say, you know, keep it moderate. Probably don't go much over an ounce for 
you know, something in that maybe 10 minute range when it comes to a boil addition. Um, I would say dry hopping is inappropriate for this style. Yeah. Um, that's just going to compete with um, those really nice uh, malt flavors that you're trying to pull out. And yeast flavors, which before we get to, I want to mention Homebrew for Life already said we are doing the Hoppy Hour on 2-17. If you didn't see the last uh, podcast Hoppy Hour live stream they did, they have a second channel as well where they just kind of shoot the breeze and talk about beer and drink beer. So 2-17, that's February 17th for those that are uh, don't know dates. Let's so go on to Put it on your Google calendars. Yeah. Uh, let's go on to yeast. Yeast uh, is actually a very important part of these uh, – um, these styles of beers because you need a yeast that's going to have some esterification. And so the yeast that we went with is Juice, a.k.a. Uh, London Ale 3 in Y yeast. And I know everyone's thinking, wait a second, that's a, that's a hazy IPA strain, right? They're, they're probably thinking that. They're probably thinking that. So, um, no, <laughs> the reality is, is yes, we use it for hazy IPAs. We ferment it on the warm side to kind of push through some of those um, nice fruity esters because they end up complementing all these New World hops. Um, but... This yeast has been around a lot longer than hazy IPAs, and it actually is a very traditional strain um, for brewing uh, bit British bitters. It produces a subtle esterification that doesn't get in the way, so it's not going to be overly, like, first of all, it's not going to produce a ton of diacetyl. I think there's zero risk of diacetyl in this yeast. Um, it's much, designed yeah. to be able to handle uh, both cool and warm temperatures, so it's got a nice temperature range, probably fermenting anywhere between, like, 64 and 72. Uh, so if you get it a little bit warm to push those esters, which I would recommend for this style, you're going to get some nice English flavors off of it. Um, it is a relatively low flocculator, but it's not super powdery like some other strains like a yeah. German ale. Um, and all in all, it just is going to complement the malts really, really well and set up a nice uh, uh, subtle fruitiness that can lean into, hey, there's hops in there without being like this is a hoppy you know, American style beer. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, speaking of flocculation, you know, unlike the Fuller strain, which I believe we call uh, the or the ESB strain, which um, we covered last week. Um, this one not having that drop out super fast can actually be beneficial, especially when you are brewing these styles of beer in Cascale. Which is um, going to be our conditioning carbonation method of the week. First of all, Dandy Dre, thank you so much for the super chat. We appreciate it. And awesome. yes, uh, these can go towards our Will It Beer funds. And definitely will. Ah. <laughs> Tell <laughs> for life, thank you. Will It Beer Fund. Will It Beer Fund. Very nice. Pretty soon we'll be able to afford even more lobsters. Uh. So, uh, yeah, so let's, uh, you know, let's just go on to, before we cover water, let's go right on to the carbonation method. Yeah, let's go on to carbonation method, and we'll finish off with water chemistry, because it is pretty important in this style. Uh, carbonation method, we're going to go with croissoning. With croissoning is a uh, uh, pretty standard practice, actually, in both German and uh, older English breweries. Um, and what this does is it takes actively fermenting beer and uses this uh, blended into your finished beer in a sealed vessel to... Uh, to get natural carbonation. So before spunding was a thing, croissoning was how they always did it. Yep, um, and that is the traditional way to do it in a cast scale. I mean, yes, you can throw in sugar. There is the argument that croissoning provides a, I guess, more traditional flavor. More traditional, um, more balanced, yeah. So. Uh, the, the corn sugar, some people say you can get high, fa high alcohols or off flavors from it. I usually don't agree with that, um, but I do like to, do, when you're doing a traditional English style beer, I do like to use traditional English style methods. So, yep, so croissoning would be the best way to um, get these guys carbonated. All right, so as for water, um, we're going to be shooting for a sort of middle road profile that's, um, you know, for overall hardness, and then we are going to push those sulfates out a little bit. Um, what do we got here for my sulfate ratio? It looks like we got about a three, four, three to four to one. Uh, um, yeah, three, in there? four, um, so, four to one. So we have to be very specific, though, about our numbers. Um, very specific, very so important. Our bicarbonate load, um, we're going to have 169 parts, parts per, per million. million. Yep. Um, um, 16.9 parts per million of uh, dissolved magnesium. You'll get some um, of that from the malts, too, so it'll kind of build back into that five to one ratio. Yep. And, uh, and we have 69 parts per million of dissolved sulfate. And again, that's going to go into 16.9 of the chlorides because you want that four-ish to one ratio. You want that high sulfate. And finally, just a very specific touch of sodium at 6.9 parts per million. Um, so make sure you hit those numbers, and your water chemistry will be on point. <laughs> it, we're, we're, that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> I mean, the ranges are right. <laughs> the, yeah, the ranges are right. Um, overall, medium, medium hard uh, water chem, and uh, yeah, get a little bit higher sulfates in there. So um, you're going to push that bitterness. 
Anyway, let's go on to our first topic, and uh, that is going to be Cask Ale, aka Real Ale. It's probably why a lot of you have tuned into this, because I'm sure you've heard of it, but don't really know much about it. And so, Cask Ale is very important for these traditional English-style beers, because they are built in a way that makes them actually pretty terrible if you serve them in traditional American methods, where we're putting them in the bright tank, getting them crashed and carbonated, high carbonated, and then serving them on long draft lines where they're going to be stuck under 14 PSI the entire serving time. These beers were designed to have their best flavor when they are naturally, uh, naturally carbonated in a closed vessel. So yeah, so let's talk about some of the differences. Um, Peter's already got uh, hit on the first one, um, which is that um, beer that is served in a keg is generally um, already bright and carbonated and designed to be drank immediately upon um, putting in the keg, where a cask ale actually requires um, conditioning time before it's ready to be served. Uh, and then also uh, a keg is served under pressure, where a cask ale um, is traditionally not served under pressure. A lot of people have what are called um, breathers now um, that allow that beer to kind of last a little bit longer while it's being tapped, um, but we won't get too much into that. And Generally speaking, you're just not allowing oxygen in in some way, but you are allowing the beer to naturally flow out. And so as these beers are served, yeah. they're designed to be basically served in one day um, yeah. or a very, very short amount of time. And so as these beers are being served, the carbonation tech level technically even goes down. Um, but that's OK, because that's going to push forward a lot of the malty and subtle. Actually, some of the fruity flavors from the yeast es esterification can become overpowering under too much carbonation. Yeah. So it gets in better balance under that low carbonation method. And finally, to build more on just that overall malt profile and the, the really the whole experience and the mouthfeel of the beer, um, while um, kegs can be served at a range of temperatures, if you're in, in uh, Europe or Germany, it might be served a little bit warmer. If you're in the United States, we typically serve our beer way too cold in my experience. Um, Cascale actually have a very specific range, um, and that's going to be 52 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit, or for those of you that are in the rest of the world, uh, 11 to 13 Celsius. You see how I put that in there? Hey, look, you did some like, math. I was like, I did, uh, actually, no, I just pulled it off the thing, but uh, yeah, so, and these are what are considered um, cellar temperatures, and again, um, this sort of um, builds into that generally lower level of carbonation, but also it allows these really nice, delicate flavors to you know come out of the beer while you're drinking it and enjoying it um, closest thing that we get pretty commonly in america to casks if you don't have a you know a place with a true beer engine and all that and a beer engine is basically just a mover of beer um, is firkins firkins are done pretty commonly and they're kind of done in the same style but a lot of times they're used to flavor beer that's already been breaded yeah um, but that's what we, that's the closest we see in america pretty firkins, commonly yeah f i mean a, a firkin is is a form of a cask yeah um, yeah, Firkin is that kind of middle because you got. But what? it's just a it's a it's countertop served. It's not served under a beer engine or anything like that. Yeah, because you got what pinners, Firkins, and Killerkins. Yeah, the uh, the ones that are served under a beer engine actually have a very specific technique from the uh, uh, what's it called? What's that thing called? Sparkler. Sparkler. Yeah, which we are gonna forgo that today. So you know. Give us uh, some super chats if you want a whole video on sparklers and and the, beer engines and, and how all and those work. I'd, I'd love an excuse to install one. I've been telling you, like, we put a little thing up top, and we can do gravity flow with a beer engine, and, like, it'd be beautiful. Yeah. Um, All right, let's go into how cask ale is produced. And there's a couple different methods that it can be produced. Um, uh, we, in America, we com commonly do, like, the add some sugar to a firkin or something like that method. Uh, but... All in all, these beers do go through regular fermentation. Yeah, so, I mean, they start out just like any other beer would. Um, they're going to go through a typical fermentation for, you know, a week or two in, um, in a fermentation vessel. Um, once that beer achieves final gravity, um, instead of going into a bright tank, um, getting bright and carbonated, um, they, that's at the point where they go into their cask. Um, and that's kind of where things start changing. Um, like we mentioned in our... Um, kind of method, um, croisoning, um, which is at that point you're going to take basically a measured out dose of partially fermented beer, figure out the gravity points, calculate um, a degree of carbonation, and uh, you're going to add that to the cask or um, some sugar, or I've, I've even heard of like some breweries will actually add DME. I guess that's kind of like the middle road between yeah. adding corn sugar. Still adding sugar, but at least it's beer sugar. Um, and just like you would for bottling, that's going to kick up a refermentation. 
um, in the cask and actually uh, naturally carbonate the beer. This process does take a little bit longer than what we usually see in a bright tank. Um, and conditioning time can actually affect the flavor. And so if you're aiming for a short conditioning time, usually with a slightly higher carbonation, you're usually aiming for a brighter cask beer. So that'd be like if you're going for the one week. Um, but the best way to do it is to let it just naturally condition over the course of several weeks. So yeah, even so as much as six weeks. Yeah. So once you get the beer um, basically primed up and uh, you got your smack your big bung on the top. Um, yeah, it'll go to actually a cellar at that point too. And I guess that's another big difference. Yeah. Is that um, where when we keg up a beer, um, at that point we might hang on to it until we sell it to somebody. Um, where those beers are usually fairly immediately pushed onto a cellar, which at that point what's called a cellar min um, takes over the process and actually um, you know, basically knows how that beer is aging um, and knows when to actually tap that beer. Um, Get on the floor. So, yeah. And once the beer reach, uh, reaches um, what the cellarman deems as mature, uh, then at that point you're going to tap a soft spile, I believe is, is how what the process is called, which is just a little wooden peg yeah. into the top of the keg. And 18, 20 years ago, it was, you know, didn't always. <laughs> never mind. <laughs> and uh, you're actually going to relieve the pressure on the keg because now that keg has been under pressure. It's been carbonating. Um, you're going to relieve the pressure. The keg might even fob a little bit. Um, and this process usually takes about a day or so. Um, and what you're actually doing is you're allowing that keg to drop down in pressure um, and come down to the appropriate level of CO2, which essentially is equal to the atmospheric pressure. Yeah, so you're going to get a very low overall uh, carbonation on the beer, but this beer will still come across kind of rich and creamy. It's going to come across because the natural carbonation has been in there uh, and it's being served at atmospheric pressure. And this is cool atmospheric pressure, but still atmospheric pressure. Yeah. Um, then you're going to get that kind of softer flow coming out of the cask. Yeah, and, that, and that's why that temperature is so specific for the seller, because you're yeah. actually looking looking for that very specific amount of level of CO2 in the cask. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, once that has come down to pressure, um, then the beer is ready to serve. And at that point, they will tap in through the bottom bung. Uh, by the way, casks actually have two bungs on them, for those of you that aren't familiar. Um, and then uh, it's either served usually through some sort of a beer engine. Beer engines are nice because they can actually pull the beer from a cellar up. Um, or it's served via gravity sometimes versus uh, sometimes straight out of a tap that's driven into the bottom of the cask. Which is the easiest way to do it. And then we'll get into some kind of hacks on how you kind of, kind of do this on the home scale, and, you know, down the road using gravity. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and at that point, the clock is ticking um, because unless you have a what's called a breather, um, then you have essentially 24 hours to drink what is in that cask um, because as you start pulling it, now you don't. Now you are changing the pressure in, of the environment, and that CO2 is slowly but surely coming out of solution, um, to the point where within about two days, your beer is just flat beer. So. All right, well, let's go into how we brew cask ale differently. So first of all, we're keeping freshness in mind, as you just talked about. We want to make sure that we're getting that beer drank as soon as it is tapped. Yeah, it's a totally different beast. You know, unlike um, some beers like, uh, you know, Meriton, for instance, is a, is a great style that yeah. a, a lawn lagering can actually, you know, benefit it, you know, in a keg, not necessarily even in a cask. Um, it's, uh, we are actually trying to turn these beers over and drink them at their prime. So, uh, so yeah, keep that freshness, um, you know, kind of at the top of your priority list. And so that's actually a big difference between a lot of beers that we, you know, make in America or we're trying to do it for either, you know, super, super fresh. It's like a hazy, hazy IPA, which we say, hey, hazy IPA should be drank at a tap room because that is freshness really derived, should. but for different reasons. Um, but a lot of our beers done here are done for mass distribution, meaning they're supposed to be stored for forever and still taste kind of okay by the time somebody drinks them. Yeah. Cascales are calculated out so that you're trying to get a good flavor on a certain day and that day is you know planned out ahead of time yeah and then uh it's be you know it's drank within a couple of minutes yeah and everyone knows you know about how hops degrade over time how you'll actually kind of the, the malt flavor like we mentioned in the in the style overview um, will actually kind of change over time and start oxidizing so that's really the point is just basically finding when these when these beers are at their peak and enjoying them while they're there Ricardo, thank you so much for the super chat. We appreciate that. Hey, thanks, Ricardo. You've, you've super chatted us before. You are awesome. Uh, bitter the hell out of it. Basically, with less CO2 by it, you're going to need to balance this with more bitterness. This goes back to the water chemistry, that 69 parts per million of sulfates, um, and it also goes into how you're bittering it. And this comes in two um, kind of categories. One is just bittering uh, with to, to a certain IBU level, and the other is the total amount of hops, which is why those lower uh, IBU hops actually kind of work, or lower alpha acid hops actually work pretty well in the style. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to the, to the English bitters, um, 
you know, realistically, if you are doing these traditionally as a cask, um, you're probably going to be bittering them 10 or even 15 more IBUs compared to what you might be doing um, if you are going to serve these uh, just on CO2 with a higher level of carbonation. It really does make that much of a difference. So, you know, basically doubling your bitterness on them. Um, yeah, people don't under understand not only does carbonation separate the beer and give you different aromatics, but carbonation also adds carbonic acid, which is a yeah. flavorful acid. It's an acid that gives you a, a distinct bite and it pushes forward the bitterness of how yeah, this is actually a big reason why um, American light lagers, um, or what we call domestic beers here, yeah. which is kind of funny because what, what do they call them in Europe? Like, what do they call them? I don't know. <laughs> like, Bud Light. You know they got to have it there. Um, oh, but, for sure. But, uh, but yeah, that's why American light lagers tend to be Import lagers? very, very high uh, levels of carbonation to them, and that's just to give you that carbonic bite because otherwise their bitterness is basically like two. And they're super grainy sweet. <laughs> yeah, they're super, super grainy sweet otherwise. Um, so, uh, yeah, and lastly, um, which, you know, something that we've reiterated many times on this show, um, is just really pay extra attention to your methods because, you know, not having CO2 um, on the beer, having, or not having as much CO2 that, that kind of gives you that uh, almost covering up carbonic bite is what I like to call it. Yeah. Um, it can definitely hide some flaws. Um, and then as well as those warmer temperatures, which will just accentuate any flaws that you might have in your brewing methods or in your, or say you're using, you know, less than ideal ingredients. Um, you just really have to be on point with that um, in order because anything that you do screw up on or anything that might not be quite up to snuff is going to show in these beers. So go ahead and make sure that your temperatures are right in that cellar temperature. And we actually have a little bit on that in our topic number two that we'll get to pretty soon. The Frazzle Penguin is buying us a beer. Thank you so much. Six point nine nine dollars. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's jump into uh, kind of how to hack um, cask ale. Or Ro Logan wrote ha ask. Yeah, ha to hask ale. Yeah, that, that was my that was my super joke. super good. That was my joke. Uh, that's I'm, great. I was proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so first of all, and we should still do a video on this at some point in time. But one of the ways that's really common that you can find out there is using a corny keg and actually chopping off the dip tube and using that as your kind of cask. And so it's going to be served sideways. You're going to have a mechanism for gravity feeding this, which you can do with just a picnic tap. Yeah. Um, and basically, you're just going to have some sort of way to slowly let it, you know, let uh, um, air in as the thing goes things. Yeah, so you're going <laughs> to nail it. <laughs> you're going to turn it sideways so that the, the liquid side is down. And you're talking about, uh, so we used to cut off the dip tubes. Yeah. And now we can actually use those little floaty ball things in there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because we, we got now have the uh, floating dip tubes, which would work too. In which yeah. case, you can just use the gas side as your liquid side and then use the liquid side as your air inlet. And then you'll have the floating dip tube on the gas side. Call exactly. It good. Yeah. So, yeah, you'll turn, well, you turn your gas side up um, so that you can relieve the pressure. Um, in the keg, and then uh, yeah. Beer is illegal in South a South Africa today. Sounds like a nightmare. What? South Africa should be illegal for beer. That's right. <laughs> We're legalizing South Africa. All oh, right. so yeah, you warm up your keg and serve at super low pressure. So that's this pressure can be natural pressure from CO2 going in, um, basically two to three psi. Or yeah, if you wanted just to just enough to push it out, if yeah. you, if you don't want to do the sideways keg trick. And, uh, and yeah, and, it's, and the whole point is that you are, are not trying to overcarbonate this beer. Um, but the nice thing about serving under a little bit of pressure is that you don't necessarily have to drink the beer all in one day. Yeah. Um, it, it will be good for, I mean, again, to emphasize that freshness, um, you know, I like to say, you know, do it for a party. Do it when, when you're going to, uh, you know, have somebody drinking it quickly. But, you know, it'll, it'll be good for at least a week before it starts to kind of fade out of its prime and this um, would be a good uh, candidate for uh, an actual gravity tap. And so what that means is, you know, if you're having your beer under like one to two PSI, yeah. CO2 tank barely even on, you get a extra long um, picnic faucet or something like that. And you just put your beer up high and then just serve very low. So yeah. they're basically you're siphoning, but with a closed system. So your beer doesn't go bad right away. You know, it is a great situation for a picnic tap because usually picnic taps are too short and you end up getting tons of foam. And yeah. uh, that should not be the case with uh with uh, sort of um gravity pseudo cash condition corny ale um yeah and uh oh and then you just mentioned the gravity tank yeah so, so gravity tank basically the same kind of thing your tank is up high uh, if you have something like a unitank or a bright tank um same kind of situation you can let it naturally carbonate in your conditioning conditioning tank uh, or some sort of gravity tank any sort of sealed vessel um the best way to do this is actually with uh one of those expandable plastic uh, 
plastic bags. And so basically you don't necessarily need to worry about outside pre pressure because you can put an expandable plastic bag in any sort of sealed vessel. Um, you can even probably rig one up to a corny keg and then just use the CO2 to squish the bag. Yep. So, and then uh, lastly, uh, to half scale it, uh, I love that. I'm, I'm so proud of that. I um, am not. <laughs> um, if you are bottling conditioning, bottle conditioning, um, you're actually kind of doing it already. Um, so, I mean, it's not, not quite the same, a little bit of apples to oranges, um, but the reality is, is if you cut back on your priming sugar, um, you'll end up with a little bit lower levels of, of CO2 in there, um, and then you can actually take the, the naturally conditioned bottle, um, let it warm up a little bit before you serve it, and if it's, you know, if Cascale might be one of those things that you're like, ah, I'm, I'm thinking about it, but I don't know if I want to invest in all the equipment to do it right now, um, you know, try that with a few batches. Um, yeah. You can even do a six-gallon batch instead of a five-gallon batch, keg up your five gallons and then you know sort of cask ish bottle condition um the last gallon and you can have a really fantastic side by side um to really kind of determine whether or not you want to really jump into committing to a cask system someone says bags are a pain to clean um i disagree because i don't clean them i throw yeah. them away <laughs> they're dispo they disposable I was like they're the easiest to clean <laughs> yeah. Boom, garbage. so then you don't have anything else to clean um so yeah <laughs> uh, another thing that people use is called a poly pan i believe Polypin are basically like a, a plastic yeah. thing that expands and contracts. And those are also semi-disposable. I think they only cost like, I want to say like four bucks, which isn't bad for a fermenter that you don't have to clean at the end of the day. No, but bags are the cheapest. They cost like a couple bucks. They, they come sanitary, ready to go. Uh, and uh, yeah, you just toss them when you're done. Um, so yeah, those are going to be the ins and outs of cask ale in a nutshell. Um, so hopefully you guys gleaned a small bit of information from that. Now um, let's jump on to our topic number two, which is what I know all you guys came here for, and it is how to avoid crystal malt as good as Genus Brewing avoids crystal malt. Yeah. Uh, wait, what? Well, we put crystal on everything. We do put crystal on everything. That's, that's true. Oh. <laughs> um, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> uh, um, so how to accentuate malt flavor without using crystal malt. If you want that big malt flavor in your beer, if your beer calls for it, like these best bitters do, um, like a lot of ambers do, porters, stouts, anything like that, any beer that calls for that extra sweetness, how can you get that extra malt character without using crystal malt? Um, for one, there's a ton of methods. Uh, there's, there's a ton. Oh, wait. What, in fact, wait, did we just cover one? What? 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 Cascale. What? Cascale, yeah. Um, some lower carbonation uh, will push through that maltiness. So. Yeah, it's going to push forward that maltiness. Also, just being naturally carbonated, natural carbonation um, is, like we said, does it, it doesn't have the same carbonic bite as forced carbonation. Yeah. So uh, natural carbonation will always taste slightly maltier than forced carbonated beer. You know, and coming from somebody that's actually had a lot of both forced carbonated and naturally carbonated beer. Mm -hmm. It baffles me because like scientifically it should all be the same, but they're totally not. They're not. Like, it's a completely different like mouthfeel and, uh, and perception of the carbonation. I bet you there's something about that because you, the acid has to come from somewhere. Yeah. You know, uh, what's the law that says that things can't be created or destroyed or something? Yeah. It's, the it's, acid has to come from somewhere. So from, if it's forced carbonated, you are getting the acid from an outside source. You're getting it from CO2. Yeah. But if you're getting it from natural fermentation, that maybe it's still coming from something else. And that's yeah, why I actually don't know the science on that, but I'm just kind of speculating right now. I'm going to guess it has something to do with the yeast. Cause like, remember like the shoot started putting yeast and stuff in their in their maybe. bits and yeah, it's, it's gotta have something to do with it. It just the eats the acids. Anyways, naturally carbonated beer always tastes maltier than not naturally carbonated beers. And part of that is with real oils or cask oils because of the carbonation levels, which we talked about earlier. So, um, yeah, so carbonation levels, uh, and then, uh, another speaking of carbonation or lack thereof completely, um, it would be, uh, nitrogenating your beer. Yeah. So nitrogenating obviously does the, has the multi benefit of not adding carbonic acid to your beer. So you're not getting that acidification, which will accentuate the malt. Uh, but, uh, enough nitrogen in your beer can actually give you a perceived sweetness on your tongue as well. So yeah, these are, that's why you see like a lot of, uh, you know, traditional stouts actually on nitrogen. Um, and that's because otherwise they can be pretty aggressively bitter. Yeah, um, and, Guinness and is, a, is, a, is a very, very dry beer that's basically just, you know, it's, it's nothing. It's water plus like roast astringency. Yeah. So nitrogen kind of brings that into balance. Not that it's like a super astringent beer, but nitrogen bring that, brings that into balance by giving that perceived sweetness. Yeah. And, uh, you know, with that said, I think that uh, the nitrogen doesn't necessarily have to be just for dark beers. Um, I have actually had, um, it was uh, so some kind of double IPA that was just stupidly bitter, like 90 something hundred IBUs. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, was a little bit, nitro. it was a little bit much for me on CO2, but I found it on nitro someplace and I was like, oh my God. 
that's what this beer was designed for. Um, so yeah, just keep that in mind, you know, and again, I think that just kind of links back to the whole, like design your recipe around how you plan on serving the beer. Yeah. So. Um, warm conditioning versus cold uh, conditioning. And so if you uh, were to cold crash your beer, that brightens up your beer and it makes it, uh, it makes it brighter, makes it tinnier. It drops out some mid flavors. If you warm condition your beer, um, you end up with a smoother malt flavor. Yeah. Uh, next is going to be choosing a fantastically tasty and great base malt. Uh, this is something, I mean, we've talked about this once or twice I mean, before. I feel like, I feel like I'm beating the horse, but it's not dead yet. The, hor <laughs> the horse just keeps getting back up. It's wow, a zombie they're... horse. Yeah, it's a zombie horse. He's just um, beating off. A ho he's just beating the horse. Yep. <laughs> Jesus. And we cross the line. Uh, uh. So like our Chevalier Heritage that we said in, um, you know, in the beer of the week this week, Chevalier Heritage is a very flavorful base malt. Uh, and I love getting flavors from base malts because usually they're a lot more complex than using something like a crystal malt. So yeah. Chevalier Heritage, uh, very uh, aromatic as well, has that graham cracker, has that biscuit note to it. Um, and it's, so it's got a lot going on. Halcyon is another great malt, even for like IPAs. Um, that has that malt flavor. So yeah. choose a malt that's got flavor if you want malt yeah. flavor. Go Heritage, go local if you've got a local maltster. Those ones will almost always have really, really unique flavor qualities to their base malts. And some base malts can have like a lot of aromas. Chevalier Heritage does. Uh, there's one from our local maltster that is purple Egyptian barley. That's a very aromatic base yeah. malt. And then they get their, their Russian wheat too. Yeah. That thing's like crazy earthy. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so malts. Pay attention to it. Uh, uh, methodologies when it comes to mashing and methodologies in general. So we've talked about this before. Decoction mash, great way to get an accentuated malt character. More melanoidins, subtle caramelization of the grains and everything. Um, and also, uh, you know, you're reducing more water so you can get a denser thing. Yep. So, uh, yeah, decoction mash is really, really great way to build up a lot of complexity with just a single malt. Um, and then uh, same thing along the lines of decoction mashes are going to be long boils as well. You know, don't be afraid to uh, bump your boil up to 90 minutes um, or even 120 if you're really trying to kind of build up that really, really complex, um, subtle, calmly character without making the beer overly sweet. Uh, if you want to take this and kind of elevate it to 11, uh, do a split boil. So take the first runnings from a dense mash or a thick mash, and that's going to be your highest uh, um, highest gravity runnings from your before you get into the sparge and put that into a separate kettle and boil that that's going to increase the rate of caramelization increase the Maillard reactions and get you a maltier sweet beer again without crystal malts yep um, yeah barley wines I think are a great example of this technique often being done so uh, step mash, low mm -hmm. than high. So if you mash in, at, let's say 136 to 138, um, probably even as high as 144, and then you just skip right up to your mash out at 160 to 165, um, uh, 60, somewhere in that range. What you're doing is a couple of things. First of all, you're increasing the solubility of certain starches, um, and you're also reducing certain proteins. Uh, and, uh, you're also reducing the breakdown that happens if you mash in right in the middle. So if you mash in at that 150 degree where both alpha and beta amylase are working, um, so you have more soluble stuff, you'll still get a high effic efficiency batch, uh, but you won't get the same uh, um, reduction of gravity points in fermentation. So you'll end up with a thicker, fuller bodied beer um, that will perceive sweeter and maltier. Yeah. So, so you're pulling the qualities out of the malt that give you the, the mouth feel and the body, um, but essentially you just don't have quite as much fermentable sugars um, in the end product. So you end up with a little bit higher finishing gravity beer, a little bit lower alcohol beer, which might not necessarily be a bad thing. But and you are kind of adjusting for that by getting more soluble stuff in there. Yeah. So, uh, you, you know, you might, you might be close in alcohol versus a single infusion at 150, but yeah. not quite there. And uh, yeah, but then you're also getting, you know, a very, very malt forward and full body beer. Um, again, along the same lines is just mashing high, which we don't usually recommend. We kind of avoid single infusion mashes that are higher temperature, but it is a way to kind of hack the same thing and get some, some more sweetness in yeah. your beer. Uh, what we prefer is always mashing low in a really, really high, highly uh, enzymatic temperature range um, for both enzymes. And then just adding adjuncts like oats. Yeah, so oats, um, also sugar lactose adjuncts like lactose or monk fruit um, all of these things can sort of build up around uh, the base of your beer build up body build up mouthfeel um, and just kind of push through an otherwise malty beer and a lot of these are you know especially like oats and lactose um, and the new milkshake ipas i mean there's really not any other way to build body in the beer by while still keeping it a very light color yep and they're a little bit more so. controllable which is nice 
So, uh, and then lastly, um, but not even close. Oh, no, nope, not even close to lastly. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> next, we have uh, water chemistry. Um, so, like we talked about in our Pilsners, uh, for instance, um, shifting your water chemistry to a more chloride-heavy um, ratio compared to your sulfates, um, as well as adding some degree of sodium, can also kind of build up on the mouthfeel and the overall malt multi perception of a beer sodium is a hack that not a lot of people know but sodium is a great at first of all desensitizing a certain part of your tongue what it does is it reduces the energy of activation for certain sweet spots on your tongue so sodium can basically make you taste sweetness better um, which is why sodium is a great complement complement to the chlorides um, mild yeast esterification so anytime you choose a yeast that uh, produces some mild esterification, as long as it's not also producing a lot of phenols and it's not highly attenuative, a yeast that produces a subset of esters, which is a lot of English yeasts, can accentuate your malt. Which, to no surprise, uh, actually explains why English yeasts tend to push through the malt of, of beer. You know, that's, uh, what is the, the classic English strain, the SO4, AO1, 1098, uh, WLP001? Two. Two. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> that strain um, is, is generally going to be um, push through a more malt forward beer or compared is it 07? to the American strain. No, yeah, it's 07. Because 07 is Whitbread strain. 002 is pub, I think. But, anyways. Lots of yeast from lots of companies. Lots um, of yeast. Going along that same mild esterification to push forward malt flavors, we just have, depending on your yeast strain again, fermenting a little bit warmer. Yeah, if you do ferment with something like an American ale strain, um, then yeah, pushing it a little bit towards that warm side can also push through um, the malt flavors. How much sodium for a five gallon batch of IPA with RO water? You're probably still looking for a, a IPA. You're probably looking in maybe the 15 parts per million on the high end. Yeah. So it's going to be like a gram yeah. or, some, or something I, like that. I don't think it's more than two grams for sure. Um, um, aging slash slow oxidation. We kind of talked about this when we talked about the best bitter and why they perceive sweet when they are in America. Um, but slow oxid oxidation can push forward some sherry notes and a distinct pseudo caramel sweetness. Yeah, um, and a lot of that comes down to, you know, what we've talked about in the past, like the, the vicinal, not visceral, I almost did yeah. it again, uh, the vicinal diketones and uh, the oxidative pathway, um, which turns into a chemical compound called pentane diol. Uh, which which ends up coming across as uh, this this sweet honey like character, which I think can often be mistaken as as a caramel yeah. malt note. And uh, uh, if you have way too much of it in your beer, it tastes terrible. But having a little bit in your beer, it's not too schmabby. So, um, but yeah, that's just something to keep in mind, especially if you are buying imported beers. You know, honestly, any if you're in America, any import bottled beer uh, more than likely has gone through a very a very arduous journey yeah. to get to this shelf. JW Lees is the best. So if any of you find some JW Lees, please send it to me. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, Harvest maybe ale. maybe stick with like the high alcohol dark beers if you're going to be drinking imports. You know, like, uh, yeah. what, what is that? The one I like from Eyinger, their Doppelbach uh, oh, yeah. Celebrator. I feel like that one tends to hold up pretty well, but you know, that's a yeah. beer that... A lot of the Doppelbachs, we did a Doppelbach tasting a yeah. while ago. A lot of those Doppelbachs come, come forward pretty good. So, but um, uh, yeah, as for like, you know, a bottle of Stella, probably yeah. probably not going to be quite what it. Uh, well, I think they actually brew it differently anyway. Yeah. But I, I've had some worse Steiner lager that still is pretty good. But yeah, um, let's talk about oak and oak tan. And oak and oak tan is a great way to push forward malt flavor. Uh, again, kind of goes with hand in hand with aging. Uh, but oak, especially if it's charred oak, and especially if it's white oak. Um, has a distinct, it has vanillins in those, and those vanillins can actually push forward malt flavor as well. Yeah, oak is a fantastic thing. I love putting that, especially with beers that already have a natural body to them. Yeah. Um, because it's it actually does two things that really balance out with each other. Um, for one, it usually provides compounds like vanillins um, that can add, that can kind of build on the natural malt flair, flavor, add complexity, um, but then it still also has um, some tannins left in it. Um, which, while they add this sort of uh, filling mouthfeel, they also add a dryness um, to the beer. And so those actually can end up really, really balancing out beers that, you know, might be a little bit too sweet or, you know, might not have quite that profile that you're looking for. And also, for whatever reason, it ser serves to uh, pull out some harsh bites, too. Yeah. Um, I had a... Um, that that dude that we talked about with Thomas that did the liquid oak when I was doing a lot of things even yeah. with the grapefruit seltzer with uh, an amber that we had on tap at the time you know adding that oak took the beer and softened it immediately yeah it's crazy yeah and it, and it is and I I don't quite understand it because sometimes it can end up being like tannic sometimes it can end up yeah not but it's, being it's yeah tannic. it's never that same bite like regular like if you chew on oak you, yeah. there's that bite there but 
So uh, Had's body. Last one we won't talk about too much before getting into Q&A because we kind of mentioned it when we went over Cascales, and that is just serving your beer warm. Yep, serving it warm. Um, it's just gonna it's just gonna lighten it up. It's gonna lower the CO2 content, and uh, yeah, make it perceived as a little bit sweeter, a little bit maltier. Will it beer needs to keep going? Love the channel. Love the collaboration with Homebrew for Life. Thank you, Rob Barons. I appreciate it. That's awesome. Thanks, Rob. All right. Let's, uh, let's open this up to general questioning. Um, bring those Qs, and we'll bring the As. Uh, and the Ps. The fat, juicy As. Wait, what? The answers. All right. You going from the bottom or the top? Started from the top. Now I'm here. Uh, all right. I'll go from the bottom. <laughs> yeah, you will. Quike <laughs> uh, uh, is said to ferment fast from Hendrick. Um, I have a batch that is still fermenting 15 days later. Did you do something wrong? Temp is at 85. It's summer in Africa. Any ideas? Huh. Um, nutrient is kind of my my first go-to for that. So um, we've had – what did he stray? Yeah, it was the Voss strain, and I want to say we've used that. Voss strain can get finicky. It can get a yeah. little weak. So definitely Voss needs a lot of nutrients. Um, that said, it will get there eventually, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, if you are stuck, go ahead and add some more nutrients and yeast rouse. Get your CO2 in there bubbling through. Obviously, try to prevent some oxygen. But Yeah, we, uh, when, <clears> we're, when we're brewing with uh, pretty much all quike strains here, we always throw in at least a little bit of nutrient at the beginning. Um, and sometimes, especially with that strain, um, we'll hit it you know, just a little bit past how, how Krausen, um, you know, a couple, couple three days in, depending on, depending on how fast it's going. Uh, so, yeah. Um, yeah, try to add a little nutrient, and hopefully that'll finish up for you. There are 174 of you watching right now, so if you know two thirds of you can give the thumbs up button, that would be really cool. Hellbrew says, "Who else dances to the beer slash malt of the week jingle?" <laughs> um, I do. Yeah, I sure do. Yeah. Hopefully, all of you raise your hand if you do. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, for all you watching, if you want to support us, please check out our website, Genus Brewing. Is it Co? Genus Brewing. Genus Brewing. Com. Yeah, Genus Brewing. Com. Straight up. And uh, we've got some awesome swag on there, as well as some fantastic recipe kits that have been designed by the people that I like to think are smart around here. I'm some actually referring to myself. <laughs> I feel like I just insulted myself now. So, yeah, please check that out. Sometimes you're smart. <laughs> How do you feel about using honey malt to lower your mash pH? It is not nearly as effective as using acid malt. It's not as acidic. Um, and it has a very strong flavor. So you – I mean – it could have some mash effects if you use it within the range that you should be using it. But for um, most light beers, especially where you're going to mash pH is going to be more important. You shouldn't be using honey malt because it'll overpower the beer. Um, Daniel is asking if kettle caramelization is consistent enough to try to account for. Does it significantly change the color slash sweetness or is it more of a tweak on those? Um, and uh, yes and no. So it's going to yeah. be very gonna kettle dependent. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's going to be a lot of people that, you know, if I have a recipe that relies on kettle caramelization and I have a very shallow um, pan and that's what I'm caramelizing in, I'm going to get a much higher rate of yeah. Maillard reaction, much higher rate of caramelization than somebody who has a more vertical system. Let's say you're doing it in a mash and boil, an anvil foundry, something like that. And I think, um, I want to say Brewlosophy actually did an experiment where they tried to get that kettle caramelized flavor, that Maillard reaction, and they didn't get it. They weren't able to yeah. tell the difference. And again, a lot of that tell, it comes down to system. It comes down to shape, and it comes down to um, power output. Yeah, I would say it definitely has much more of a significant impact on color, especially um, compared to flavor. Um, I think, you know, with that said, when we've done like <coughs> three hour boils, it definitely has an effect on flavor. It's huge. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it does have a significant effect on color. And that really, like Peter said, it's going to depend on the kettle, depend on the heat input too. You know, if you were using like the, the all in one electric systems that are only throwing 1500 Watts at it, um, versus if you've got a big propane burner outside, um, you're going to get a lot more, um, you know, change in color, um, and a lot more caramelization with that propane burner. So um, I would say if you've got a high boil off naturally, then yeah, pay attention to that caramelization. If you, if you generally have, you know, like say only a, a one gallon boil off, you're probably getting a really small amount of caramelization. So yeah. um, honestly, the impact with the air too uh, affects it, which yeah. people don't really realize because it also impacts evaporation. Uh, uh, altitude will affect it. Um, it. Homebrew for Life asks, is one pound of C60, Crystal 60, is that the same as eight ounces of Crystal 40 and eight ounces of Crystal 80? Um, I'd love to answer this one, but I've never heard of any of those malts. So I, I don't know what they are. <laughs> the answer is no. 
No, they're not. So there's a, during the caramelization process, the making of caramel malts, um, basically you're taking really longer chain sugars that have that nice honey-like sweetness and you are shortening them and pseudo burning them. Same thing with caramelization. You're just making different compounds. And so, uh, yeah, C60 is kind of right in that middle where it has that caramely note to it. Um, when you get it to C80, you start to get like toffee-like notes, a little yeah. bit of kind of burnt. And that's kind of where I, I start liking crystal malts a little bit better as C75 and above. Um, so I would prefer taking that to the extreme ends. I would prefer eight ounces of, you know, C15 and eight ounces of C120 over a pound of um, C60. Yeah, for the most part. And the beers that you're throwing it in, usually that's going to be better for it. Um, so, yeah. And I'm kind of like, I like to just avoid, like, anything from 30 all the way up to that 75. Yeah. Um, and I'm either going, like, super light with it just to add a little bit of a little bit of back sweetness of, you know, some like really low ABV session beer. Um, or again, like you said, I'm looking for those like really, really complex, like roasty toffee, dark, dark pruny notes from the, the heavy ones. I'm in the same boat. Someone's asking, have you guys seen breweries selling beer in plastic bags, like a bag in a box of wine kind of thing? Uh, I haven't, but I've seen it. I've seen it done before, but I, ha I don't see it out on store shelves. We were just talking about this last week of how like it'd be smart. Some, somebody honestly. had the growler bags, <laughs> yeah. like a couple years ago, and it never j it just didn't take off for like, probably yeah. obvious reasons. Like when you open it, it's just gonna go everywhere. But if only they thought of the like if they had all the same resources that they went into like the UK talking about just doing bag in a box stuff, I would buy one of those. Honestly, a bag in a box kind of growler that you just throw the bag with them. Maybe you have like a 50 cent gr uh, bag that you throw away every time, yeah. but when it seals up, you pressure cask serve sure, it or whatever. Yeah. Um, we got uh, Daniel's asking if uh, we've ever used Skagit malt. Um, and uh, we have not actually. No, nope, I have access to it. One of our vendors carries it. Yeah, I was gonna say, I feel like we could probably get some if we want to play with it though. We have currently 120-ish different kinds of malt here. Too many. We've got, yeah, I think just Pilsner malts alone, I have like five or six Pilsner malts. Yeah, it's, 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 it's getting a little silly now. Logan hates me for it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not opposed to getting more, but at the same time, we well, it's are. Because it's, now people come in, they're like, I want Pilsner malt. And I'm like, which one? Yeah. I want like, Heidelberg. There's more than one? Yeah. I want Heidelberg Pilsner. I want Lions Pilsner. I want Baroness Pilsner. I want, uh, now we have, uh, we just brought in Thomas, or not Thomas Fawcett, Franco Belge's Czech Pilsner. I want Belgian Pilsner. Like, you got to have it all. I want floor malted Pilsner. All right. Uh, oh, I think we're actually caught up to each other now. Something about Logan beating off dead horses. That's where I just passed on the way down. Yeah. Going back down to the bottom then? Yep, back down to the bottom, I suppose. Provoke hops ideas. I don't know what that is. Is rice a good substitute for flaked corn in a Kentucky Common? Uh, no, no, it's not. Rice no. is going to be, uh, it has like a perceived sweetness and a little bit of creaminess to it, which is a little bit weird. It's still highly fermentable like corn, but corn is a very distinct flavor that is, that is needed in a K Kentucky Common. Yeah. Kentucky Common is like if American lager was a dark lager, like was a Schwartz beer yeah. kind of thing. And it's, you know, I would say in other styles, let's see, um, I'm trying to think of like, okay, maybe a cream ale, right? Where you might be throwing in, uh, you know, a half pound or a pound of rice or corn, you could probably swap those out. But but a Kentucky Common, you're talking like thirty percent corn. Yeah, it's like a good it's, amount. It's a stupidly high adjunct load in there, and and that really it does create that flavor profile of that style of beer. So. And Logan really needs his load in there. Uh, here's a good one. Water. What minerals do you keep on hand for adjusting water chemistry? And this is and the one right above it is ascorbic acid, three ga grams as powder and keg. Will it impact yeast? Uh, no, three grams of ascorbic acid will not impact your yeast. Yeah. And that kind of goes into the what minerals do we keep on hand. So ascorbic acid, not a mineral, but we keep it on hand. Uh, gypsum, calcium chloride, I use a lot less than most people, but it's good to have on hand. Um, just regular sea salt. Uh, honestly, regular yep. sea salt, sodium chloride, it's good to have on hand. Uh, baking soda, soda, I hardly ever use, but I have it in certain recipes. Uh, and then classic chalk. Yeah. Some CaCO3. gypsum. Uh, yeah. and as well. Oh, uh, oh uh, no, Epsom, Epsom salt. salt. Yeah. Ah, James Five. You owe me blowjob. Anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so those are those are those are all the ones that are possible or kind of possible. But uh, the most common ones you'll see is if you have gypsum, that's probably the most common one. And a lot of people keep just gypsum and calcium chloride. The the hard part for me with that is it doesn't adjust for magnesium, doesn't really adjust for the total bicarbonate load, um, and it's really hard to fine tune your sulfates to chlorides that way. Yeah. Yeah, having a nice collection of different salts They're will, super will allow cheap, you to so play with, well. will, will allow you to really get the, the water dialed in better um, because it is 
if you if you ever have tried to build up a water profile from scratch, um, you will sit there on the computer for um, at least 10, maybe 15 minutes, just like doing a little bit less of this one, a little bit more of this one until you get them all, all kind where of you to, want them. to where you want them. Yeah. And, and what I will tell you on that is don't try to hit exact numbers. You're never going to do it. Um, just get, get within, you know, a range and then call that a day because otherwise you'll be chasing them. Do you adjust your uh, cold mashing water for pH when you do the dark malts for a black IPA? Nope. Uh, the only thing that I make sure to do is use super neutral water. So I'm going to buy you know distilled water, or I'm at very least going to pre-boil my water. Um, I don't want to risk any chlorines or anything like that being in there. So just buying distilled water for your cold mash is going to be better. I'm not interested in any enzyme activity, so pH doesn't really matter to me in the cold steep. Um, and then again, I have my entire mineral load that's going to flavor my water base, usually in my mash. How full is your mineral load? My mineral load is, is full because I haven't <laughs> dumped it in a while. Um, <laughs> when alcohol becomes legal in South Africa, would we export? We can't export. We're not big enough. No. Yeah. Um, I got one from uh, Dandy that uh, says, ha I have some wild yeast now and a starter. What beer do you think would let that yeast character shine? Uh, raw ale with, uh, I would even say probably a kettle sour or a co co pitch with a sour, um, some, some sort of raw ale or yeah. just a high, high adjunct beer. Yeah. But I actually like the idea of a pre something that's pre-acidified because it's going to select against anything that's not going to be good for your beer yeah. just in case. I don't know. I, I think if, he, if he's already got a strain isolated, um, more than likely if it's wild, it's going to be pretty funky. So sort of design a recipe around that sort of farmhouse saison type thing, um, kind of going back to what we mentioned again earlier. Um, find a really nice tasty base malt, um, keep a really simple hop bill for it, um, and uh, yeah, call it a day. That'll let that yeast kind of really come through and show you what it's got. Do we have a target amount of citric acid to add to five gallons of seltzer? Uh, added three mils of 88% lactic and want to use citric for this round. So citric, as terms yeah. of pH adjustment, is not as powerful as lactic, but it is much more flavorful. So I can see it working, but we usually just use lactic. Um, if I were to take a shot at it for a seltzer, because it could be a little bit tart, um, I would say for like a five-gallon batch, maybe, well, give or take um, like a milliliter per gallon. Um, I don't think sounds completely unreasonable. And grams, dry citric, you're looking at... Oh, for dry citric. Oh, yeah, yeah maybe... You're looking at three, three grams, maybe? Yeah, I was going to say maybe closer to half that if it's dry. Um, so, um, and that should be a nice subtle starting point. You know, you could probably al always add more. It's just going to get more and more pungent. And if you ever taste citric acid just by itself... It's it, not bad. It, it actually has... It's not bad, but it kind of has a weird flavor. I think you got to balance it with, uh, with some other acids as well. Yeah. All in all, it's, it's not as precise, or at least not something that we've really nailed in. We've done citric acid as a blend for sours, like sour beers. Yeah. But um, I have a batch fermented with uh, Bohemian Lager that continues to have slow airlock activity. After two weeks, there isn't any film on top, and it smells fine. What gives? Normally, airlock stops after one week. Oh, it's probably just still fermenting. Yeah. Especially if you're, if you're fermenting cold, that could still just be, you know, could yeah. be going. Also, it's going to depend on how many bubbles. It could be a natural, like, temperature spike can cr cause bubbles in the airlock. There's a lot of things that that could be, so. All right. Um, we got Homing Scone says, is yeast temperature shock a thing when rehydrating yeast and pitching into cold wort? Um, our experience, no, not, not really. really. Um, yeah, we haven't, haven't noticed any, any significant <coughs> difference between actually trying to rehydrate um, yeast versus just pitching it straight in, um, at least for a five gallon batch. Um, when we do real large batches, like, um, downtown, when we do the five barrel batches, we rehydrate the yeast, but that's just because we got a big brick that we're throwing in there and it just kind of helps it homogenize quicker. Uh, so. when in, when in doubt, just do a yeast starter. So even if you're using dry yeah. yeast, a yeast starter is the guaranteed method. You're going to have your yeast active and ready to go. You're going to build more yeast by the time it gets into your beer. And just a safer bet. Who was that like last week or was that a Facebook message that somebody was like, was like, hey, man, I made a yeast starter and pitched it in and it's bubbling like two hours later. I'm, I'm worried about it. <laughs> I'm like, that why are you worried? Great. It sounds like it <laughs> sounds like it took off. Oh, no, that's they had the lag phase question. Oh, they're, yeah, yeah. They're like, how long is the lag phase? I'm like, zero. You already went through it. Yeah. <laughs> like you're under full fermentation now, buddy. <laughs> uh, yeah. Regarding the pH drop in Quike, I think my raw IPA brewed with Scare got a little bit scare i guess that's one of those uh, anyways got a little bit too sour is there a way to raise ph after fermentation uh dry hopping will raise ph yeah and kind of solve that a little bit you i mean 
you're going to taste if, if a certain acid is past flavor threshold, regardless of pH, you're going to taste it. Even if you raise pH again, um, that said, if you wanted to add some chalk, that's totally fine. Um, if you're aiming for a certain pH rate, uh, for just general acidity, but for lactic specifically, if you have, you know, you can have like a four pH beer that has a lot of lactic acid, but also a lot of like bicarbonate or something. And then you'll still take the taste of lactic acid. I got, uh, we got a question. If you, if you happen to make a really, really malty beer, um, is there a way to calm it down or are you stuck with it? Um, I can think Brett. of, yeah, I was going to say, I was like, Brett is one. And then again, um, actually dry hopping it too. You, you might be able to balance it out. Kind of depends if it's like a super, super dark beer. Um, that's just like overly sweet. Say it's an imperial stout that didn't quite finish out for you. Um, I think adding Britannomyces um, and letting it age out for a while is probably the better way to go. Um, if it's, you know, a lighter or a, a paler beer um, that just, you know, got a little bit too sweet for your liking, um, even like an amber ale, you could probably throw, you know, an ounce or two of dry hops at it. Um, and it, as long as it's not too far off, it should, uh, it should come to a nice level. Uh, what would be your recommendation for a pale malt and a lighter beer? I usually go with a Maris Otter, but I'm looking to change it up a bit. Still want malty flavors, but nothing super overpowering. My favorite would be Halcyon. Halcyon yep. is a super tasty light malt. Uh, anything else? Ever use phosphoric acid to adjust pH? We have. It is also relatively flavorless. It's got a, a you know high flavor threshold. Yeah. Um, so it's good to use, but we usually just use lactic because... If lactic ever passes our flavor threshold, we don't really care that much. And it doesn't if we do our math right. I think we're pretty close to being done. Reverend says he's got 300 ppm of bicarbonates. What, what should he do? Uh, make lots of stouts. Yeah, English porters all day. <laughs> English porters all day. Uh, no, I think I've said this. I actually, at my house, or, I have. Or add some gypsum and boil it ahead, ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah, so you can do what's called slaking, I believe. So if you boil it, it'll actually drop down to about 80 ppm. Um, but that's a lot of work. So I actually have that same range at my house. And what I found worked fantastic um, is just sparging with distilled water. Um, because having that high minerality in your mash is fine. I get great conversion as a result. Um, but yeah, when it, all I do is I sparge with about four gallons of distilled water, drops my bicarb load and basically in half, and now I'm down to a really reasonable level to work with. Yeah, if you do your mash pH so. adjustments for lighter beers already in your, in, your, uh, in your strike water instead of in your mash, uh, and you pre-boil your strike water, you actually will get some of that carb bicarbonate out yeah. before it goes into your beer. Though. So that's another way if you want to do some extra work too. Um, um, Kurt wants to know if he can reduce the magnesium. He says he has 60 ppm of magnesium in his water. Um, uh, no there's not really a way, but I, I, I mean, there, there is a way. I just, yeah, it's not the same as uh, bicarbonate where yeah. calcium will do. I want to tell Does him not magnesium to magnesium come with what's magnesium. What? Yeah. I want to tell him not to worry too much. It's probably from at running it through a water softener, um, is, is probably where all that magnesium is coming from. But I want to say magnesium really has a high flavor threshold. It doesn't really affect flavor. It's um, the or, most thing it's going to mouthfeel. I would add more calcium though. The most thing it's going to affect is yeast activity. If you don't have enough calcium. Yeah. But yeah, I still, yeah, I, w I don't know if I'd worry about it even at 60, but yeah, it's like there's, there is a way to precipitate it out. I just don't know if it's, uh, if the, whatever you'd be adding to it would change the flavor too much. Yeah. And I'd have to relook into that. Where do you find Halcyon? Local homebrew shop doesn't carry it. My go-to website doesn't eat it either. Um, anybody that carries Thomas Fawcett malts should be able to get Halcyon. Yeah. Yeah. So. Ask your local homebrew shop. They might be able to order it in for you. They'll probably make you buy a whole bag um, if they're a smaller shop, but you know, if you, if, if you, you brew yeah. frequently, it'll be well You can run it. through a bag pretty quick. Um, my lager yeast has green apple flavor. Could it be the fifth generation L13 yeast, or could it be the use of EKG on the hot side? No, it's probably, it's probably the yeast, but green apple flavor can, it can go away. Yep. Yeah, I was going to say, that sounds like you just need to uh, let it sit a little bit longer. Well, mushroom beer. We did that already. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we actually are growing some mushrooms upstairs too, <laughs> so Jeez. we might even be able to show you some homegrown mushrooms uh, in the beer. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ricardo. I appreciate that. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, yeah, there's a. It was the one with the golden handle and hella beer. We had chanterelles, yep. but chanterelles were a really uh, pungent mushroom too. So those came through in the final product, and I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it in either beer. Um, the Doppelbach, I didn't think was the right choice of the beer for hella beer to do. I think the IPA was a really fun idea that Golden Handle did. But it was definitely like a mushroomy IPA. Yeah. 
All right. Oh, also, uh, what's their faces do the mushroom beer all the time? Uh, Hidden Mother. Ah, there's another. More people want us to do a sake thing. There's so much out there on sake. I know just enough to know that I know nothing. Yeah. Um, sake, sake can be a really complex thing, and I wish that we had the resources or like somebody around here that was like that has done a bunch of it that we could come in as a guest. But uh, you know who the best yeah. person to probably help start R and some sake would be would probably be Thomas. I yeah probably <laughs> that guy that guy's pretty much tried it all. Um, so. so yeah, oh, we can bring him in for that. Someone ordered a Brewers Edge Match and Boil with Pump yesterday and wants to thank us for the videos on that system. You're welcome. Yeah, perfect. Um, let's see. Are we pretty much caught up on everything? I think that is caught up. I think it's time to tell everybody to hit the like button. We're at 98. If we, we get two more, we'll be over 100. If uh. we get 102 more, we'll be at uh, 200. Asian-infused Willet beer. That I can definitely get behind. I am that half sounds... expecting that to be today's Willet beer, and <laughs> I see Ryan pulling up right now. Hey, we didn't have to call Ryan. Nice. There you go. Perfect. All right. <laughs> uh, on that note, thank you, everyone, for watching the show today. Uh, Instagrams to find out what's going into Willet beers and all that. Yep. Follow us on Instagram. We'll be doing some Willet beer posts. Uh, follow us on all of our other social media, Facebook. Um, stay tuned to YouTube. We try to do at least a video too every week. Um, we do these live streams every Sunday. Sunday morning at 8.45 Pacific Standard Time AM. Again, if you want to support us, check out our Patreon as well as our, uh, uh, as well as our website. <laughs> That's our Ryan trying to get in. And uh, we've got some awesome swag and some recipe kits available on there for you to purchase. Otherwise, we will see you next week. And thank you once again for tuning in. What? Oh. Hi. Hi, Ryan. Thanks everyone who super chatted us. We really appreciate that. We do. We really appreciate super chats. Don't come back here. What? I'm not doing it. You should just left it going and be like, Ryan, why are you naked? <laughs> <laughs>